Oh, it's just an error. Okay, well, the first, uh, the key thing I think to recognize is that we have a major problem globally on sustainability. We need about one and a half planets to live on at the moment. If we all lived at US levels, we need about five planets, Australia about four, and so on. I mean, quite clearly, that's not a sustainable proposition. And something has to give in terms of the way that we're actually uh, going to live in the future if we are actually to um, sustain 7 billion people, let alone going on to 9 or 10. We're already seeing the convergence of various limits because of that constraint, um, particularly on the peaking of conventional oil, climate change, water, food security, <coughs> and um, finally financial and social instability. The first four of those are basically biophysical. And this is not something that's acknowledged, I think, in the conventional discussions uh, amongst economists or politicians or business leaders. But basically, the biophysical constraints are now driving the global economy. And if you look at what's happening, for example, in Egypt and Syria at the moment, it's talked about in religious or conflict terms um, and political terms, the core drivers behind it. I would argue is basically climate change. And uh, that is an example, I think, of what increasingly is going to happen around the world unless we start to take far more rapid action than is being contemplated. A very quick bit of paleo climate history this is a picture of the world since uh, well, 65 million years ago. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> this is a quick view of the paleo climate history of the world over the past 65 million years ago. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But the period in which we've evolved is the Holocene, which is right at the right-hand side here, the last 11,000 years, that tiny little bit in which we evolved as we currently are. And if you look at the peak of the Holocene, that's the green arrow, um, we're now uh, above that by about 0.6 degrees C, that's the orange arrow. And if you look at the red line of 2 degrees C, which is the official target we actually have, and you go back in time, that takes you to the point at which the Arctic started to ice over. So if temperature rises to 2 degrees C, which is our official target, then that implies over time that there will be no ice in the Arctic. And if you go to 4 degrees C, which is what we're, but to the trajectory we're currently on, you go back, way back to uh, about 37 million years ago, which is the point at which there was no ice in either the Arctic or the Antarctic. So what we're talking about is a set of implications which are dramatically different from anything that we're being told officially, in the sense that um, 2 degrees C will have a 6 to 7 metre sea level increase, which will wipe out cities like London, New York, Shanghai, and so on in the current form. And if you stick to where we're currently going, 4 degrees C will produce 70 metres rise over time. Now, that's not going to happen tomorrow morning. It's going to take a long time for that to evolve. That's basically what you're locking in by taking the position that we are. If you look at the way global temperatures have moved over the last four decades, you can see the darkening areas increased warming, and particularly the Arctic and the Antarctic, well, the Arctic particularly, but also the Antarctic, is warming much faster than the rest of the world. What are the implications of that? Well, it's in the way in which sea ice is disappearing in the Arctic. And this shows the uh, history since 1979 of, uh, of actuals, the um, variable lines and the smooth lines are uh, fits basically through that quadratic fits. And what it's looking uh, on current trends, it will be ice-free in summer in the Arctic by 2015 and probably all year round by 2030. Now, this is stuff which wasn't supposed to happen until 2100. So big changes are taking place. And the big issue is the question of tipping points in the climate, where you suddenly get a flip from uh, one stable state of climate to a completely different state, which is much less amenable to human development. And the tipping points are typically the, the Arctic, which I've talked about. But one of the implications of that is the melting of the permafrost and the emissions of methane that are currently held in that area, which are about um, <coughs> two to three times greater than the um, greenhouse gas content, carbon content in the atmosphere. Now, once that starts to go, then it's very hard to actually stop it. It becomes irreversible. 
And if you look at what's going on at the moment in the Arctic, there are signs that that's actually what is now happening. We're starting to see that occurring in increasing sense. Um, if you, you probably haven't seen it much in the newspapers here, but Siberia this year has had the most amazing range of bushfires and uh, peat fires, and unfortunately it does look as if it's starting to take off a lot faster than people think. The implications of that is we probably already um, passed climatic tipping points. At the 0.8 degrees C warming we've already seen, let alone the extra 1.2 that's coming because of our historic emissions. And we really have to move to some sort of emergency action if we're going to stop the full impact rolling through. I won't go through all of those points, but all of these things, once they start, um, you have very little uh, ability to stop them. And our inaction today is probably locking in the beginnings of a lot of those changes. There's a lot of talk, of course, that warming uh, has basically stopped uh, since 1998. Sadly, that's not the case. The heat content of the globe has been going up. It's basically been going into the oceans. And one of the ironies is that one of the things that's been stopping surface temperatures increasing not as fast as previously is actually the increasing coal burn in China, to which, um, sadly, we've been contributing to a fair extent because of additional aerosols essentially in the atmosphere as well as some other natural variations in the, the climate system. There's a lot of people, a lot of discussion about the questions of adaptation to 4 degrees C, and a lot of the debate in this country has moved away from mitigation to saying, well, we now have to adapt to what's going to happen. But what does 4 degrees C really mean? Well, unfortunately, it means a world where population probably reduces from a combination of effects from around 7 billion to about 1 billion. And these are some of the comments that you get from the top scientists around the world. <coughs> so this is not a situation you can adapt to. It isn't possible to adapt to a 4 degrees C world. Business is not possible in that world. You actually have to mitigate to stop it happening in the first place. And that's the point we're fundamentally missing. <coughs> so what's happening on the energy front? Well, from a fossil fuel point of view, we are continuing to increase our fossil fuel burn. Uh, that's what the IEA projects if we don't change anything. And as the chief economist of the IEA said, if that's what we um, lock into, then we're basically all in trouble. And the IEA themselves are recommending strongly we really have to take much stronger action. The problem, of course, is the death rattle of the fossil fuel industry is likely to become extremely nasty. Because what we're now seeing is people are moving increasingly into unconventional materials, unconventional gas and oil, where the energy return on investment, which is the amount of energy you get out for the energy you put in, is dropping dramatically. It used to be 100 to 1, say 50 to 1 at the end of World War II. On average, it's 20 to 1 today. And the new unconventional technologies are all below probably 10 to 1. And if you want to run uh, an, an industrial civilization, the minimum is about 10 to 1. Otherwise, you don't have enough surplus energy to keep the whole economy running, to run your cars, drive your buses, build your buildings, and so on. So what this means is you have to start moving to rethink the whole concept of economic growth. And the, when you put climate and energy together, the problem is we can only afford to burn today around 20% of the total proven fossil fuel reserves in the world. Not the resources, but the proven reserves you can economically extract today. So you then have the question, well, why are we continuing to explore and what value do we place on fossil fuel companies? So most of that um, fossil fuel has to stay in the ground if we're to stay below 2 degrees C, and 2 degrees C itself is even too, too much. Now, the official solutions are not working. The things like carbon capture and storage, clean coal, and so on. Uh, we're locking in high carbon infrastructure today, which will mean our emissions are locked in if we don't do something about it. And big changes to the system take decades to put in place. We really have a fundamental leadership failure in terms of what we, um, the responses we're making to it at a policy level. I won't go through all of those, but it spans the political system expands business, I think major NGOs, sadly. And the fundamental problem is a lack of systems-based thinking where you actually join the dots and put all this together. We have solutions, but we really have to move to emergency response if we're going to have any chance of staying 
within a level which prevents dangerous climate change, and it's a much greater level of response than we're currently seeing. It does require an emergency war footing, in my view. I don't think there's any other way to do it. Um, we do need to talk about it. I know people don't like talking in those terms. But divestment is an essential part of that, as a, a part of the acceleration of the process um, of starting to move to that emergency level. So just to summarize, the challenge is much greater than anybody is telling us. Um, the official solutions are basically not working. We're not going to see a resolution just by market forces. It's going to take a lot more than that. And the war footing approach, I think, is essential. And divestment, as I said, then becomes a key part of it. Thank you very much.